you, Randy. Morning, folks. Morning. Well, what I'm going to talk about is mostly history. Uh, how did we get where we are from when we started? In 57, they launched Sputnik. And <clears throat> it occurred to some physicists at Johns Hopkins University uh, Applied Physics Laboratory that uh, if we knew the predicted location of a satellite um, by measuring the Doppler shift of the signals, uh, we could then determine the position uh, of an observer uh, with respect to the uh, predicted position uh, of the satellite from its ephemeris, which is the same way we do it nowadays. Uh, in 1959 <coughs> was the uh, beginnings of the first world uh, geodetic system. The um, U.S. Army came up with this, and uh, a good deal of the uh, design and implementation was due to uh, Dr. Irene Fisher, who was a retired Austrian school teacher. She was a full um, four foot five inches tall. Uh, when I got into the uh, Army, they had a classified symposium on geodesy. And I had never been to a classified anything before, so I signed up for the thing because I had the clearance. And um, when I got there, I was a big, bad second lieutenant, and I thought I was hot stuff. And I never saw so many admirals and generals in all my life. So I decided to sit in the back with the other junior officers. And a few speakers came up on board and then Dr. Fisher came up, and she walked up from one side of the, the stage, and there was a, about a, a, a two-foot square box with stairs for her to stand on so she could see over the podium. And halfway across the stage, she stopped, and she looked over, and there was a row of admirals and generals all on the front row. And she walked up to one admiral, and he was the commander of all the nuclear submarines in the U.S. Navy. And she chewed him out for his uh, uh, submarine captains not filling out the gravity data. And they were wasting her geodesist uh, uh, time. And all the other generals and admirals were just laughing and turning beet red. And this one guy just slouched down in his chair. And after she finished bawling him out, she got up and then gave her talk on, on uh, uh, gravity. That was Dr. Fisher. Well, the first one was in, uh, pr published in 1960, WGS 1960. And at the time, all the way through uh, the, the early 70s, this was top secret code word. Um, if uh, you disclose the name of WGS 60, much less its parameters, uh, <coughs> you'd find yourself in chains and leg irons for the rest of your life. And uh, th that was their, their first development of a world geodetic system and a worldwide gravity model at the time. But it was based on astrogeodetic deflections uh, measured with uh, T4 theodolites and uh, uh, movements of the stars across the observer's local meridian rather than anything with the orbits. CCOR was the first. Um, satellite system that was put up by the U.S. Army. Uh, it was a, a, a nifty system. It was the first of its kind, and it compactly fit in uh, only one 18-wheel uh, semi-tractor trailer. Uh, that's, not in that's not including the uh, diesel generators. And um, I was a uh, company commander back then, uh, waiting for a security clearance. And uh, our generator operator was in Chiang Mai, Thailand. And uh, he got into a fight with his NCO in charge. And a uh, fellow was shipped back to me in uh, uh, chains and leg irons. And that was the first uh, courts martial uh, Army map service has had since World War II. But that, and he was a generator operator for one of the Sea Corps tracking stations, which was in Chiang Mai, Thailand. And the reason why it was there was they were going to put up a Shoran antenna to provide uh, control for the B-52s for the bombing of Hanoi Harbor. And later on, the NVA went over there and blew it up. Uh, ANA was uh, the second geodetic satellite. This was uh, Army, Navy, NASA, 
uh, an Air Force, and uh, they put up a couple of those, and uh, it was used for some uh, triangulation to determine uh, p relative positions of uh, continents, and that was followed up uh, through some work with uh, Dr. Helmut Schmid. Uh, he came up with uh, spatial triangulation by means of photogrammetry. This was in uh, 1951, yeah, October 51. And uh, Dr. Schmid was one of the uh, German uh, V-2 rocket scientists who came over with Werner von Braun. And uh, he developed the cameras initially for tracking ballistic missiles and the V-2 uh, uh, rockets uh, at night uh, using uh, photogrammetric triangulation. And those were then uh, modified slightly and used for uh, the first civilian uh, geodetic satellite program which was the BC-4, primary network. Uh, and uh, we see right over here, right there, that's uh, Chiang Mai, Thailand, where they had a BC-4 uh, satellite station also. And uh, this was the, like I said, the first uh, civilian program, and this was run by uh, NOAA and the National Geodetic Survey. And Dr. Schmid uh, moved over from uh, Aberdeen Proving Ground uh, to um, uh, Silver Spring, Maryland, or well, Rockville at the time. Do you ever meet him? Boy, he was a crotchety old guy. <clears throat> I was, by that time, I was a captain, and uh, he was used to dealing with uh, generals, and uh, I went over there on a tour of what he was doing, and uh, they introduced him to me, and, and I held up my hand, and he looked at me and mm, turned around and walked off. So he wasn't very impressed with junior officers. This is the BC-4. This is a Ville T4 astronomical theodolite where they've taken the, the telescope out and they've replaced it with a cast iron 12-inch uh, focal length mapping camera, which was used to photograph for the star field background as a missile went across uh, the field of view or later uh, the uh, uh, balloon satellites that were uh, illuminated by the sun. Uh, this particular one is my personal instrument. It weighs uh, a mere 250 pounds, and uh, it's been about 25 years since I've been able to pick it up. So now <coughs> I've, I find uh, my biggest students uh, in uh, uh, class, and I have them uh, pick the thing up and assemble it to, to try to turn some angles with it. This is Pagios, and this was a uh, mylar uh, luminized balloon that was put in orbit, and uh, the BC-4 satellites uh, would uh, track uh, this as it would move across their, their field of view. And uh, Dr. Schmidt was in charge of the uh, data reduction for uh, the tri photogrammetric triangulation from one spot to another based on Pageos observations with the BC-4 uh, cameras. <clears throat> then the, the military came up with WGS-66, and this was the primary uh, geodetic system and geoid that was used for the majority of targeting for intercontinental ballistic missiles. <clears throat> At the same time that they published that, uh, the Navy was coming up with a system which was the transit satellite system. And the transit satellite system uh, and observation of its orbits uh, then uh, was done with uh, Magnavox 1502 geosievers. And uh, initially this was a top secret program. And um, about around that same time, they had developed welding technology so that they could uh, construct larger and larger uh, stiff uh, leg platforms for exploration into the North Sea as well as further out into the Gulf of Mexico. And they were getting beyond the, the range where optical theodolites could, uh, uh, or, or that the National Geodetic Survey had established control. So the, the oil industry started looking for geodetic surveyors. And they noticed that the U.S. Navy had a bunch of sailors who were getting out of the, the service, and their military occupational specialty was geodetic surveyor. So they hired a number of them, and uh, they got them all together, and... Uh, got them into a room and they showed them their, their brand new theodolites and the sailors looked at it and says, what are those things? I said, these are theodolites. You're, you were a geodetic surveyor in the Navy, weren't you? I said, 
Yeah, but we didn't use those things. We used a 1502 geosiever. I said, well, where can we get those? I said, well, you can't. They're classified. So uh, a number of uh, uh, oil executives went and visited some senators in uh, uh, Washington and pointed out how much they had been contributing to their campaign uh, funds. And uh, sure it would be convenient if they would get this declassified. Well, eventually they did. And uh, uh, that opened up the possibility of geodetic satellite surveying to the private surveyor. <clears throat> that was the World Geodetic System of 1972. And in 1974 is when it was declassified and Thomas Seppelin published a paper which listed uh, the transformations between WGS 72 and the national geodetic coordinate systems of many countries all around the world. Uh, most of them convenient, conveniently happened to have uh, sedimentary basins where there were hydrocarbons uh, under development and uh, it was of particular interest to the oil companies. Then <coughs> eventually they came up with Navstar, which is the uh, global positioning system, what we have today, and the WGS-84 ellipsoid. And <coughs> it is almost identical to the uh, geodetic reference system 1980, which is what the National Geodetic Survey uses for the ellipsoid for uh, NAD83. The difference between the two is about in the 14th decimal point based on the fact that the International Union of Geodesy and Geophysics defines the Earth's gravity field with a different equation than the U.S. Department of Defense, hence the, the difference at the 14th decimal point for uh, a reciprocal of flattening. And that's the uh, GPS uh, constellation uh, of uh, uh, 24 active satellites, plus they have a number uh, in orbit in different orbitable planes that are activated when uh, one goes down. <clears throat> so with GPS, it was the first time that three-dimensional positioning was possible, okay? The problem is with GPS, it yields ellipsoid heights, and you cannot get elevations straight from GPS. What you have to have is the geoid. Problem is, the geoid's top secret, okay? So the solution is to declassify it and to observe more gravity. So uh, Dave Zolkowski will get into the particulars explaining uh, the, the geoid and its relationship between the ellipsoid and uh, the uh, uh, terrain with respect to uh, uh, the, the geoid, which is vaguely uh, related to uh, mean sea level. <coughs> when Rene was talking about gravity. Um, there are a couple primary ways that we observe gravity. One is uh, with a relative gravity. This is a Lacoste and Romberg uh, G-meter. This is one my graduate students uh, at the University of New Orleans were using to observe relative gravity at every benchmark in Jefferson Parish and St. Bernard Parish, as well as many in Orleans Parish and we went from Grand Isle through Jefferson Parish to Orleans Parish and all the way over to Ocean Springs. This was done in the early 80s when uh, we were doing uh, second order leveling projects in the metropolitan area. Um, and this is the, that's the cannon at uh, Fort Pike near uh, J92. <clears throat> also, uh, new technology came up with the absolute gravity meter. And this is the FG5. Uh, this thing uh, weighs a couple hundred pounds, uh, and it comes complete with a geodesist and a truck. <coughs> um, this is observed uh, absolute gravity across the street on the University of New Orleans campus uh, by NGS. They've come through uh, five separate times and observed gravity uh, with a year and a half, two years uh, spacing in between each observation. And each time that they have done that, just at that one observation spot at the University of New Orleans, they detected an increase in absolute gravity as the University of New Orleans continues to sink closer to the center of the Earth at a rate of 9.2 millimeters a year. 
and since then uh, we have also had both the National Geodetic Survey and the Department of Defense come through and observe absolute gravity at several dozen of the LSU uh, core sites throughout the state of Louisiana as well as uh, the Stena Space Center. This is one of the independent observations used to track the rate of subsidence through changes in absolute gravity versus uh, GPS observations versus uh, first order geodetic leveling. <clears throat> this is a T4 astronomical theodolite that the military used. And this was used specifically uh, with uh, electronic gear. Uh, this thing here, uh, it's a little lighter than my BC4. This probably weighs only about 200 pounds. <clears throat> but uh, these wires then connected to an 18-wheeler. And this was a uh, project that was uh, uh, run by the Geodetic Survey Squadron out of Cheyenne, Wyoming. And it was used for a computer tracking, uh, the passage of stars across the observer's local meridian. And it was used to, to detect the slope of the geoid. And this was done specifically for the MX missile program. Because the majority of high precision geodetic research over the centuries has been to find better and more effective ways of killing people in war. Okay? And this was the, the, the culmination of uh, uh, the enhancement. And the reason why they were into gravity so much for the MX missile program is that the GPS system was not operational yet. So when they would fire an MX missile to go over and knock out uh, Turitam in, in Kazakhstan, where the Russians had all of their missile silos, <clears throat> the uh, guidance system was not going to be based on satellite positioning. It was going to be based on gyroscopes. And gyroscopes work with reference to local gravity. So they had to know what the cross-section of the geoid was from where they would fire it from the missile in North America to the cross-section of what gravity was to where it would hit in Kazakhstan. And that was the reason for the enormous research into better and more effective ways to do a, a research on the gravity field. And as a result, to our benefit, they started beating their swords into plowshares. So the fall of the Soviet Union was in 91. And <clears throat> the result of the fall of the, the the Soviet Union was afterwards, the Russian generals saw that there was no longer a, a need to have all of their missile silos fired up and ready to, to launch and to start World War III at any moment. So the Russian generals started turning the keys off. And with the Russian generals turning the keys off, the U.S. generals started turning the keys off for our ICBMs. And as time went on in the early 90s, when, when we had a special geodetic project to do using the early uh, 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 satellites with, where we'd only have a window open in a particular part of the world for you know, three or four hours once a day, we could get geoid processing done by the, the uh, uh, Defense Mapping Agency uh, they wouldn't tell us how they did it, but they'd give us the results so that with long static observation periods of geodetic uh, uh, GPS observations, DMA would then give us an elevation as, uh, as a, a result of our GPS observations. And at UNO, we did that for uh, a mapping project, surveying and mapping project we did in uh, Guayaquil, Ecuador in the uh, middle 1990s. So that's what it looks like. This was the first geoid. This is a part of it. And it's a bunch of numbers. It's coefficients. It's 360 degree spherical harmonic coefficients. And this is the sort of thing that is used to compute what the separation is between the ellipsoid and the geoid. EGM 96 is the first one that was declassified for the entire world. This has a nominal accuracy of plus or minus a for every phase or 
flood elevation surveys in the United States. But this was the grandest thing ever seen, and this is the next best thing to slice bread for geodetic surveying worldwide. The National Geodetic Survey took this data and then they reprocessed it, pro reprocessed it so that it would be optimized for the North American continent. And from that, additional gravity observations, the new GRAV-D program and the like, have enhanced this, have enhanced the accuracy and the development and the continued research into this sort of stuff through the efforts of the National Geodetic Survey is what is getting us better and better handles on accuracy for determining elevations from GPS observations. But the Rosetta Stone between GPS and elevations is a geoid model that's essentially a, a theoretical computation with coefficients of how we get elevations from ellipsoid heights. So <clears throat> they came up with a National Height Modernization Study as a report to Congress because <clears throat> Congress was asked NGS, where, where do we go from here? Because first order geodetic leveling is what, $1,500 a kilometer? And it's getting a little too pricey nowadays for all of the leveling that was done in the 20th century. And based on the improvement in technology for GPS receivers, dual frequency, and the improvements in the quality of the development of the geoid by the National Geodetic Survey, NGS demonstrated to Congress that this was the way to go and this was the, the original development of the National Height Modernization Study that uh, uh, Ms. Shields uh, administers. So what do we have nowadays? We've got GPS. We've got the Russian GLONASS system that some of you have uh, uh, that capability in your receivers and some of the stuff that LSU's Center for Geoinformatics in our GulfNet system, we've got some uh, GLONASS subnets up and operating in southeast Louisiana and uh, northern Louisiana. Galileo is the um, <coughs> geodetic satellite system uh, that the uh, goofy Europeans think they're going to make money with, but they've put one or two up in orbit already. It remains to be seen how much money they're going to make <coughs> with the euro. And then the Compass is the equivalent system that is being put up by the People's Republic of China. Uh, and there's going to be an enhancements to our GPS system with the addition of a third frequency, L5, which is uh, going to make, uh, theoretically, a life easier for uh, a lot of consumers. Uh, you get near geodetic accuracy with your cell phone, or so they think. So, at this time, uh, if you're awake, uh, we're going to have a coffee break for a half an hour, and uh, please note that uh, we have displays set up by both NEI and Hagen Trammell, and their representatives will be on hand in the back of the room to answer questions uh, and uh, help you with uh, thoughts you may have with uh, increasing your, your uh, capital equipment investments. Thank you, gentlemen.